Welcome to Climate Optimus. I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. Thanks as always for tuning in. When I told my girlfriend this week that we were going to be talking about carbon pricing, I think I might as well have said tax law. (laughs) She didn't say anything, but I feel like the look on her face sort of said everything. Well, she's not wrong. (laughs) Last night, the look on my face, I was sitting there looking at this cross-eyed going, holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, let's be real. Carbon pricing isn't at risk of becoming sexy anytime soon. No. However, I think given the the narrow window that we have to act on climate change, the fact that we need to get it right the first time. Yeah. And that, you know, there's carbon pricing being considered right now in Congress as part of this reconciliation bill, which we'll get to. I feel like it makes sense if we're all a little bit smarter on it. Uh, and that enables us in turn to be able to advocate for it. Yeah. it's and When you break it down, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. And hopefully we can make it yeah. easily understandable for all of you as we walk through today's episode. You better. So this week's <laughs> <laughs> this week's reason for hope, uh, I found a recent Pew Center study that shows uh, what I think are some pretty promising views on climate policy, especially among younger Americans. And, and some of this might have been obvious, but it, it's good to, to look into this and see what the actual numbers are. You know, uh, Gen Z folks and millennials are much more active than older generations in addressing climate change on and offline. So like advocacy stuff? So yeah, when asked if climate ch- change should be a top priority to ensure sustainable a sustainable planet for future generations, I thought those numbers were really high across the board, where Gen Z and millennials were at around 70%. Wow. Boomers and older were at 57%, which I thought was, was pretty high, really. Uh, in our wheelhouse, in the last few weeks, engaged on social media with content on need for climate action. Uh, Gen Z was like 45%. And you get, yeah, obviously, some of the older, like the boomers, the, the spread's like down to 21%. But uh, that's why people need to listen to our podcast and interact with our website. <laughs> <laughs> we need those numbers to go up. So on these statements, the U.S. should prioritize alternative energy development. I was surprised that overall, U.S. adults, 71% of this study agreed with that statement. That's great. All across the board. Um, Gen Z, obviously, and, and millennial, millennials were actually really high on that. They were an 81% agree. U.S. should phase off use of fossil fuels. Uh, that's where there's some definite gap between the younger generations. Uh, Gen Z and millennials were like at 43 or 42% in agreement that U.S. should phase out use of fossil fuels, boomers down to like 25. So really almost like two to one. But I think it's good to note that it seems that the younger generations are really, you know, grasping some of this. Uh, favor of phasing out new gas-powered vehicles, U.S. adults, 47% agree with that, which almost I thought half. was pretty high, almost half, you know? I yeah. mean, But even there was a big split amongst Republicans, Support for expanding use of fossil fuel sources is much lower among Gen Z and millennial Republicans. Asking if they support more offshore oil and gas drilling, it's like 48% amongst Gen Z to 79% for boomers. So the boomer and older, you know, they're like 80, 80%, you know, in support of more offshore oil and gas. This is like, among the Republicans. Yeah, amongst Republicans to, to only 48 percent of Gen Z. So you can see a big split even amongst Republicans between the younger generations and the older generations that really the younger crowds really, you know, seems to be taking this climate change very seriously. Well, and I think maybe you sort of alluded to it as you were talking about the fact that they're more engaged, but that's sort of positive, right? If, if the people who take it more seriously, Gen Z millennials, are also the ones that are more likely to be involved in advocacy, that's that's a hopeful message, right? Because right. that means they're going to be the ones who are influencing policy and not folks that, you know, might share among the boomers more, you know, favorable views of, of fossil fuels. Before we dig into what carbon pricing is, why it's a preferable solution in many ways, and how it works, I thought it'd be good to give a refresher on the climate targets that we're trying to, to hit. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that in order to keep us at that 1.5 degrees of warming or less, which is, you know, avoiding that 
tipping point where things get really bad, we need to really be cutting our emissions by 45% or more by 2030, and that we need to hit net zero by 2050 or earlier. Right. And, and progress is being made. We'll get into, you know, some examples of countries that are that are taking positive action, but the, the world overall is still behind, so we have catch-up work to do. And if you look at the Climate Action Tracker, which is a group of scientists that that looks into the different policy proposal put forth by countries. There are a handful that are now in what would be called like the almost sufficient category, countries like the United Kingdom, many actually African nations. Then you kind of the next tier of sort of insufficient are, but getting better are the European Union, Japan, the US. And then you have a few folks that are in that highly insufficient bucket like China and, and Australia. What's wrong with Australia? Scott Morrison, they're, Prime Minister has really been a bit of a joke when it comes to addressing climate change or taking it seriously. Oh man. I think you're saying he's contemplated not attending the the UN climate summit in Glasgow here. Really? Which would be pretty crazy. Um expect he's trying to avoid having to face the music on that one. Well, they're a big coal country, right? Is that what's driving this on his part, do you think? Or is it just other things or Yeah, I'm gonna guess that his stock portfolio is weighted pretty heavily <laughs> to coal exports. I just want to know where the guy's going to live when Australia burns up as climate change continues. Yeah. I wonder how much support publicly he has on some of this. Maybe we need to get an Australian on here to, to speak about. We could do that. Speak about what's, what's going on. Maybe I need to get a kangaroo to kick that guy in the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So we should just jump right in to carbon pricing. I, I know that you have a lot of knowledge on this stuff and you've you've done a lot of research here just right off the bat you know what is what is carbon pricing yeah i think you're generous on the amount of knowledge i have i think i probably know enough to fool some people but well i'm gonna check here and make sure you're right and if you're wrong i'm gonna hit a buzzer (laughs) yeah so carbon pricing in its most basic form is about assigning a cost to greenhouse gases so co2 and, and related ones the idea behind it is that it's correcting you know a market deficiency by accounting for the negative impact that obviously carbon emissions are having on on the world and by doing that it sends a you know a signal market signal to to folks and to businesses to to move away from from carbon right and most people have probably heard of kind of what are talked about as sort of the two primary flavors of that which are, are a carbon tax and and cap and trade and i should call out because we're not going to talk about it today there, there are other options aside from a carbon price. There are things like renewable energy standards, mm-hmm. fuel economy standards, et cetera, which can be helpful mechanisms. The challenge there is that they're not economy-wide. They don't hit every facet of the economy. And so if we're really going to address emissions across the entire economy, we need something like a, a carbon price. Right. So it kind of basically deals with the reality that there is a cost to producing carbon and kind of attempting to fix some sort of price to that that can be realized ahead of time, you know, instead of dealing with the cost after the fact. Right. Yeah. So in a perfect world, once we recognized that this was an issue, you know, going on 40 years ago now, we would have put in a carbon price then that would have helped us account for that. And then we could have made more informed decisions. Right. And so is this a desirable thing to do? Why, why, why do governments or states or whatever want to do this? Yeah, I think there's a number of reasons why pricing carbon is is kind of a desirable approach. The first, at least for economists, is the fact that it's a really efficient way to reduce emissions. You end up generating emission reductions for the lowest cost, which mm. the idea being there, you're just having, you're getting to the cuts you need to make without having an undue impact on the economy. The other piece is coverage. And I just mentioned this when talking about standards, you can design a carbon price to cover the entire economy from, you know, industry to the power sector to agriculture, et cetera. It, it really can cover everything. Right. Another key piece is that a, a carbon price helps drive innovation. So when you're talking about the fact that we need, when there, that there's value in developing additional technologies that are going to help us decarbonize, having that price signal out there gives investors and innovators the confidence they need to go invest and try to create these technologies that are going to help us accelerate our transition away from 
from fossil fuels. That makes sense because they know they're going to have to spend either way, right? So they either invest in, in trying to cut carbon down or they're just going to pay for the carbon. Right. It makes sense to try to get out ahead of it. And then the fourth thing that I think is really desirable about a, a carbon price is that it, it generates revenue. So, you know, you can go out and say, you know, thou shalt move to renewable energy or, you know, m- you know we, we're going to stop selling gasoline powered vehicles and move to electric vehicles, mm-hmm. but that doesn't create any revenue. And the reason that that revenue is important is because when we transition away from carbon, it's not going to be free. And so right. having that revenue there enables us to provides money to shield consumers, you know, every, everyday Americans from the increased costs that are going to come with a price on carbon, especially when we look at like lower income folks. Yeah. It's kind of like a safety net for them, right? Exactly. Exactly. Cool. So, so how does this, how does this work? So what are the, the different plans or if you want to call it that and, and how do they work? Yeah. So we can start with a carbon tax, which I think is probably the easiest to visualize. Basically, you're assigning a price to CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalents, and then that price goes up with time. Mm-hmm. And then the basic principle is as the price goes up, it gets high enough that emissions start to fall. And in an ideal world, you would have it set up so you'd start off at, let's say, $20 a ton, and then it would go up by you know, like $15 a year and just keep going up and driving emissions down. I see. Cap and trade, I think, is a little more confusing for folks. I, I know it is for me. Uh, so cap and trade sets a cap or a limit, basically, on the amount of CO2 emissions. That cap over time is is reduced. And the way it works is each ton of emissions has to be tied back to like a permit or an allowance. And those are typically auctioned off to polluters. And so polluters can either decide to keep purchasing those allowances or whether to clean up their act and then trade those to another company that might need them. I see. But the basic idea is you set a cap, you have all these permits tied to what's allowed, and then as time goes on and the cap shrinks, so do the number of permits. Yeah, one of the ways I remember hearing this described, and I don't know if I'm quite grasped it all the way yet, but the cap and trade sets the cap to achieve a set environmental goal, and then the cost is determined by the market forces? Yes, and a tax sets the cost, but the environmental impact is driven by market forces. That's that's a perfect way to think about it. And that's sort of the most, at its core, the fundamental difference between the two. Cool. So you were telling me that you had a kind of some kind of ice cream analogy to describe this thing. I'm interested to hear what that is. Yeah, we'll see if I can pull it off here. So <laughs> I think... One way to better explain a carbon tax and cap and trade is to think about an ice cream shortage. And so let's let's assume that Ben and Jerry's is having a, a chocolate ice cream shortage. You know, the amount of cacao that they need to make their chocolate is in short supply. And so they need to reduce the consumption of ice cream in order to make sure that they can get through that shortage and not run out. So if Ben and Jerry's was going to use a carbon tax what they might do is increase the price of a pint of chocolate ice cream by, let's say, 25 cents per week. And then each week that price goes up until consumption eventually drops to a level they need it to be. Cool. That That's predictable, right? If you're an ice cream person, you know what you're going to be paying each week and you can kind of budget if, if yeah. that's important to you. It also moves ice cream fans to maybe other flavors away from chocolate while chocolate has this shortage. So that's kind of the way to think about carbon tax. Basically, the price of your chocolate ice cream goes up, everybody buys a little bit less, and they keep increasing that price until they get they reduce the amount of consumption enough to get to where they need to be. Right. Okay. I get that. They could also use kind of a cap and trade approach, which would be to kind of go to an ice cream voucher system. In other words, you'd have an auction for vouchers for chocolate ice cream each week, and then Ben & Jerry's would reduce the number of vouchers by let's say 10% each week until again, they reduce that consumption down to where they want it to be. I see. So to your point earlier, the price isn't going to be as predictable, right? Because if people really want chocolate ice cream. They'll just pay. They'll just pay. But ultimately there's going to be less out there. And so right. they're controlling the supply. I see. And just like cap and trade, if you bought a voucher and decided you didn't need it, 
you could sell it to a friend who really wanted an extra pint. Or if you're a good friend, you just give it to him. Right. Cool. Very cool. So yeah, to be clear, for the chocolate ice cream lovers out there, we're not aware of any shortage of cacao beans that might impact chocolate ice cream supply. But anyway, hopefully that helps <laughs> <laughs> helps explain carbon tax and cap and trade in a way that's a little more understandable. Awesome. No, I like that. I like that uh, that analogy. So judging from what you've found in these ideas, well, which approach do you do you like or which, which one do you think is best? So in thinking about the best approach, there are a lot of positive things that both cap and trade and carbon tax have in common. Cap and trade, as you alluded to earlier, provides predictability on the timing of emission reductions. What it doesn't do is encourage reductions beyond the target. Mm. A carbon tax offers predictability on price, which you say, well, why does that matter? For you know the business world, that's an important thing is to know what emissions are going to cost by year. They can plan more for that. So that's that's an important thing for them. Right. It you know is often touted as, as simpler and requiring less administration. But I think the, the key piece, which you mentioned, is just one is predictability on price and the timing of emissions is less predictable. The other is predictable on emissions, mm-hmm. but you could potentially have big variations in price. I think what researchers have shown, especially as there's more of these programs out there, is that both a cap and trade and a carbon tax can deliver the same result if they're designed correctly. Right. Designed correctly being the important term. I think a natural question is we're focused on carbon pricing is like, what's the current state of affairs? And we thought we'd cover a few examples. I know you did some research on on Canada and kind of what exists within the U.S. Yeah, well, Canada has a carbon tax with a rebate. Oh, Canada. So in 2018, (laughs) Trudeau, Mr. Fancy Pants himself, (laughs) he's kind of fancy, isn't he? A little bit. He's a little fancy. I mean, he's he's, he's he's sharp. Kind of a heartthrob, right? We could put a poll out there on our website. Well, he passed this thing in two... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'd given all the credit to him. No, it was passed by his government in 2018. And they have a current price of 40 Canadian dollars a ton. And they're moving to 50 next year. And then $15 a year after that, up to 170 bucks a ton in 2030, which that's, is pretty substantial, you know? That's great. And the good thing is this rebate gives 90% of the funds are going back to the households, which is kind of what we talked about. Really huge. Majority of families are coming out ahead on this. You know, families of four get between 600 and and $1,000. So that's pretty huge. It's kind of that, that safety net we talked about. and A, a safety net and, a, and an insurance policy to make sure that people continue to <laughs> support it as yeah, exactly. stuff gets more expensive. But they're getting it done, so that's cool. What are they uh, doing over in uh, European Union land? Yeah, so Europe uh, has a, a cap-and-trade program they call it their emissions trading system. Their current price on carbon emissions is, those would be, in the case of the cap and trade, their their permits, it's about 62 euros per ton. And the exciting part about Europe's system, I mean, they've already generated some reductions. Uh, back in 2019, they were effectively 25% lower than t- 1990 levels. Some realized that maybe their targets for 2030 were too low, and so they've ratcheted those up and are targeting a 55% reduction in their emissions by 2030. But I think the most exciting part, honestly, is the fact that they this year passed what's called a border adjustment, which is basically like a kind of a carbon tariff, if you will. So, mm. you know, goods that are carbon intensive that are coming into the country, like steel, aluminum, fertilizer, are going to be hit with that tariff if they're not coming from a place that has an equivalent or higher price on carbon. And I think what's exciting about it is that that may be one of our only levers to influence countries that are holdouts like Russia, China, India. Countries are sort of saying like, hey, you guys got to pollute for years. Why can't we? Which feels kind of like an argument like saying, you know, you guys got to kill a lot of people. So why can't we? (laughs) Right. Um, But anyway, I, I think by and large, Europe's program is pretty comprehensive. It sounds like they've, you know, still got business groups that feel like it's too strict and environmentalists are not satisfied. So maybe that's... Well, what's new? A happy middle ground. <laughs> what, what about the U.S.? We don't have jack. No, we we have no national pricing. 
as of now. It's been a challenge, and it's kind of been politically difficult to get done. Uh, but there are some states that have kind of taken the lead on this. Uh, there's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is comprised of 11 of the eastern states. Uh, that's only in the power sector, but still really substantial. It's a lot of states and yeah, obviously a big, big chunk there. Uh, California has a basically what's the first multi-sector program that they created in 2013. So that means it basically covers everything in their economy, you know, not just the, the power sector. So And obviously, California is a huge state, so that has a big impact. Uh, Washington is the second state uh, with the multi-sector cap-and-trade program. But all of this combined gets gets us to the fact that more than a quarter of the U.S. population lives in a state with carbon pricing, which is cool. And, you know, these states also represent a third of U.S. GDP. So... That's exciting. Even just with the states, that's, that's that's a huge thing, obviously... You know, it would be cool if we could get, you know, kind of a federal pricing program going, right? So, which kind of leads me to my next question of is, what are we going to do? Like, what's your recommendation? I mean, I'm honored that you asked me for my recommendation as though that carries a lot of weight. Um, <laughs> no, I I think given all the research I've done and would be interested in your thoughts too, but that in an ideal world, we'd have a carbon tax and a, a rebate where we return you know, 90% or more of those revenues back to, to households, kind of like what you, you know, we're talking about in Canada. The, the reason for that being, you know, it's kind of least impact on the economy. It's transparent, which I don't think is insignificant. Like it's good if the American people know what's going on. I think the more confusing a government program is, <laughs> the less likely it is to be supported. And, you know, coming back to, you know, rebate, like you discussed in Canada, I, I would argue in some ways, while, you know, obviously, reducing emissions is the first priority of a, of a carbon price. The second priority is really maintaining support and and making sure that lower income communities can at least break even or come out ahead. And I think having that, that 100% or 90% rebate is going to ensure that that's, that's the case. Otherwise, we risk sort of you know, winning the battle and losing the war, right? We, right? we We get this thing passed, and then if we don't have a good rebate in place to cushion people, then people push back as the price of goods go up and you have like a referendum on it like Australia did many years ago now. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. What what are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, I'm pretty much in agreement with you. There there was, when I was first looking at this, I I saw some ideas about how this carbon tax, a carbon tax could help pay for the current, uh, you know, infrastructure bill. Right. Right. That was another option of what a carbon tax could do. And I think they said it could even like the the modest estimate, which the number that's always thrown around, I think is like fifteen dollars a ton on carbon could raise like seven hundred to nine hundred billion dollars. Wow. To to help pay for the infrastructure bill, which I think is good. But I also think that politically what's going to be more appealing is probably the rebate plan to rebate like 80 80 to, you know, 100 percent of that back to uh, families. Well, we were talking about it before our session here that by having that that rebate out there, it allows politicians that may have made promises about not raising taxes, et cetera, to give them political cover. Yeah, and doing some research, I, I, I feel like the Biden administration and other legislators are, are kind of worried about going back on that promise of not hitting the middle class with, with taxes. And, you know, I, I think w- when I read about the $15 a ton plan, it was it equated to like 14 cents a gallon or something on gas, which, you know, that doesn't, it's not outrageous, right? And and we, we have pretty cheap gas here, I think, in the U.S. anyway. So I think a lot of people in Europe or Japan would look at that and be like, That's you nothing. know, like you have nothing to complain about. So yeah, I think the carbon tax with the rebate is the thing to do. And to be honest, I, when I look at the goals that we've set for, for reductions in emissions, I really think that a, a carbon tax is a really great tool for us to get to those. Right. It just seems like a win-win. And obviously the best plan is one we can get past, right? <laughs> right. I mean, obviously a, a good plan now is is going to be better than a perfect plan in 10 or 15 years. Totally. So we just need to find something that we can get support on and see if we can get it done. Well, and you pointed out to that end that there, as part of the reconciliation bill, you had, I think, three senators that 
added a price on on carbon to that. And so I guess one could argue that now what we need to do is is get behind the folks that are that are holding out to try to win their support for that. Yeah, I agree. You know, senators like Cinema and Mansion, right, to get them to support this thing. And I, I think we talked about this earlier, like you said, to to make this a viable solution to transfer states like West Virginia out of their current situation, you right. know, into renewables, this would actually be a really great thing for those states. Like they're probably gonna have to transfer out of it anyway. Right. And it's happening. This money it could just go to the people that this is going to impact. So it just makes sense to me to to implement a carbon tax like that. Yeah, agreed. I mean, with coal phasing out anyway, at least with a carbon tax, you're going to be have the potential for some money to send back to places like West Virginia and other coal dependent areas to help them with the transition. If, yeah. if you don't do anything, to your point, right? The companies leave, get boarded up, and then people have no jobs. Yeah. So I, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to thank them on our our Facebook page and our Instagram, uh, Widen Shats and White House. Those were the three behind the those were the three carbon price. yeah behind the carbon pricing idea. And we're going to create a post to thank them. And what we want you to do is comment and like this post as much as possible and share it so that we kind of get these numbers up so they can see this support coming to them for doing this and that there's there's backing on this. And we're going to post that on Thursday the 14th. So please go there, go to our site, go to our Facebook, go to the Instagram and share and like these posts. Yeah, let's see if we can generate a little little momentum and... Um make sure that they know that this is something that Americans recognize is going to be good. Definitely. So, you know, thanks as always for, for tuning in and come back next week for more climate solutions, reasons for hope, and ways each of us can make a difference. Climate Optimist is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. That's climateoptimist.co. And as always, follow us on social at Climate Stewards Collective.